1.6 billion dollars. Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, two, three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, my dream to become a billionaire was shattered. Yeah, I, I, I'm serious. I was so hopeful that I win that prize and and change my life forever. I had so much plans about that money. But you know, um, you know, it's okay. I think. Every one of us has uh, this idea that something, a miracle, happens in our life and changes everything, make us happy and content. But in reality, it's not always like this, right? These occurrences are very rare. And in fact, um, I think the uh, content and happiness is within us. You know, how we feel about ourselves our position and uh, accomplishment in life, our relationships with others, and our contribution to life and universe. And uh, if you think about it, it's all within our reach. It's in our control. And I think we have the choice. So last year, we, I worked so hard to prove the point that it's possible. It's possible to reach that level of personal growth and contentment by understanding the value of what we do, changing our mindset, and embracing the challenges, the daily challenges, and creating an incredible connection with each other, ourselves and others, and reach that level or higher level of contentment in life. Now, this year, the goal of this program is to just work on strategies. So no more proving the point. Whoever wants to know about it goes back into the, to the website. But it's all going to be a strategy, a how to improve ourselves to reach that, that higher level of personal growth and to be the best version of ourselves. So for that, as a first meeting of 2016, I um, have the pleasure and honor to have um, Lorraine Aguilar, who is uh, Chief Engagement uh, Officer of Work in Harmony, and uh, speaks regularly around the world for um, senior leaders in different major companies, and is uh, um, well known internationally for her uh, work for the Non-Violent Communication Program um, to create a, a collaborative and compassionate uh, workplace. So please. Lorraine Aguilar, who give her a round of applause. Thank you. Wow, it's, um, I, 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 I mean, I've been in front of everyone from senior leaders at Nissan and Guangzhou, China, to the United Nations. And it's funny, I feel more nervous than usual just standing in front, in front of my local hospital. This is just around the corner from where I live. And I think part of the reason that I'm noticing a little bit of nervousness is that empathy is a big deal for you. In the work that you do, I'm, I'm really struck at how much of an impact all of you make on people's lives on their physical well-being and their emotional well-being. And so I'm honored and I'm humbled to be in your presence today. And I'm hoping that by sharing with you some of the tools that I use, that that might uh, help make the work that you're already doing make a little more enjoyable and even more powerful. I want to give a special thanks to um, Dr. Anush Hami. I, I don't know if he's here yet. He's the reason that I'm here. 
um, as well as Dr. Iraniha. Um, at a holiday party, I had a, a, a long conversation with Dr. Hami um, about his own personal story that he's already shared with you. And I was so moved when he told me about this program um, that uh, he connected me with Dr. Iraniha. And hearing his story, I was moved even more. And so it's really a joy to kick off your new year, 2016, as your guest. Okay, so what I'm hoping that you'll all get to, from today is a new way to listen with even greater mindfulness. Listening beyond the words to connect with what really matters to people. And by doing that, it can actually increase not only your connection and the humanity of any sort of exchange with someone, but it can actually make it more efficient. Uh, Long story short, this is a very small slice of a very large program um, that my company does. And I, I had the honor of being part of a team from uh, one of my colleagues in New York who did a, a six-month program for Merck Pharmaceutical at their headquarters in New Jersey. And by employing the technique that you're going to learn, along with a number of other techniques in the field of nonviolent communication, they were able to reduce their meeting time by 60% or more depending on which department. Can you imagine that? Reducing your meeting time by 60% by listening with more empathy? So this is not only about con human connection, it's about efficiency by quickly getting to the heart of what's really wanted and needed in any situation. So I'm hoping you'll find this as useful as it is um, moving. And as I mentioned, what you're, you're learning is adapted from a, a, a communications framework called nonviolent communication. It was founded by a psychologist named Dr. Ro Marshall Rosenberg in the 1960s, and since then it's been used. Um, probably the more, most common applications are things like mediation, counseling, relationships. It's used in prisons, it's used in shelters. It is even used in hospitals, in the medical care field. What keeps me busy, literally around the world, is that it's finally catching on in large organizations. From the CEO of Microsoft saying that nonviolent communication and empathy is a way for us to have an integrated Microsoft, to, as I mentioned two months ago, teaching this to senior managers at Nissan in Guangzhou. So it, it's interesting to see that workplaces are waking up to the need for meaning and humanity and connection and empathy as a way of working well together. So, and in today's interconnected world, that does make sense. We're far more interdependent, we're far more collaborative. We need to be agile to be relevant as an organization. And so, and you as healthcare professor, professionals know what I mean by agility, right? Are you ever sitting still? So, so I'm hoping you'll find this to be very useful. I love this photo because it, for me it really gets to the heart of what empathy is all about. There, there are a lot of ways to describe empathy. It's our natural state. I mean, how many of you are pet owners? Any pet owners here? Have, have you ever noticed that with your pet when you're feeling down or ill? Your pet just naturally wants to come and, and, and be with you. And so that's the emphasis on, on empathy. It's not so much a doing as much as it is a being. Being with. And as simple as it sounds, that's often the most difficult thing for people like us, for professionals like us. Like you, I started my career as someone who was hired to solve problems and, and give advice. I, my first career was as an engineer. So how many of you would characterize yourself as advice givers, problem solvers, troubleshooters. I'm guessing that's probably most, if not all of you. People come to you, right, to get information, to get advice, to find a course forward. And so, what I'm hoping you'll get from this course is an understanding that even though our expertise is still important, even though our knowledge is still valuable, if we first connect with empathy, you'll find that the advice part actually goes more effectively 
and more smoothly. So um, instead of jumping to advice, connecting first to empathy. And, and you'll have a chance to experience that today. So I, I drew a fourth grader's version of a, a, of a, a picture. What, what do you think this is? Ice. Ice. Hey, OK. So I, I'm, I'm more of a Picasso than I thought. OK, so this is, this is my uh, child's rendition of an iceberg. Because this, for me, this sums up a really important distinction in nonviolent communication. And that's the distinction between what we call universal human needs and strategies. So a little bit of jargon here. On your desk, each of, most of you will see some cards. These cards have a partial list of some very common universal human needs, things like reliability, responsibility, trust, appreciation, safety. We can go on and on. But in nonviolent communication, there's a long list of what we call universal human needs, things that every su single human being, no matter how old, no matter how young, no matter how healthy, no matter how ill, whether they're here in California or whether they're in a village in Africa, that the same human beings can value the same things. Like, again, safety, appreciation, respect, integrity. This is really important because this is the key to connection. This is the key to empathically hearing beyond the words and being with what's important to someone. In NVC, in nonviolent communication, we distinguish between needs and strategies. And the reason strategies are simply the behaviors and the things that we do to meet our needs. For example, let's say if I have an itch, right? I have some discomfort. What's my strategy to, to meet my need for comfort? Right, exactly. Um, let's say I have a need for love. That's a human need, right? What might be a strategy for me to meet that need for love? Go to the bar. Go to the bar? <laughs> okay. Dr. Rania, may I, may I, may I make a, 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 a generational comment? <laughs> That was just a joke. Pe people in our, in our peer group often say go to the bar or, or a dating service. When I speak to millennials, <laughs> do you know what they say? Swipe left, swipe right. <laughs> Seriously. So, and what's interesting here is that connection, empathic connection happens at the level of needs. This is a big takeaway for you. And, and again, we're going to practice this. And all conflict happens at the level of strategies. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say, you know, I grew up in LA, for real. And I know what it's like to have helicopters over my house. Um, and I know what it's like for my parents to fear my safety as a child. They freaked out when I took my bike out of the neighborhood. You know, I mean, we, we lived in a pretty tough neighborhood when I was little. And can you imagine that as an adult right now, my need for safety is still important? Right? You know, I, I've known people whose houses have broke, been broken into. Um, you know, as a woman in the world, you know, safety also has some special considerations. Someone who likes to travel. So, can you feel an empathic connection with me for my need for safety? Even if you're not a woman, even if you didn't grow up in a tough neighborhood, can you still feel some empathy for me? That, why safety is important, right? So, so take a moment and really savor that connection, that human to human, we have a connection around the need for safety. It's something we all share. So now let's demonstrate how easy it is to go from connection to conflict. What if I told you that my strategy for safety is that I carry a gun? Now how connected do you feel to me? How do you feel? Yeah, you might be scared, you might be angry. What's she doing bringing a gun into a hospital? I didn't. But, you know, you, you might feel, yeah, resentful. So do you see how easy it is when we go to strategy, how we can break connection? So why is this important? Why is this distinction important? A lot of the work that I do in organizations is about how to collaborate. And a lot of collaboration is overcoming the resentment overcoming the us and them, overcoming the blame. 
that happens around strategies that we may not like. And the way we overcome that is to go back, go back to the needs. So let's say, for example, if Dr. Iraniha was compassionate enough to connect with me, he could say, hey, Lorraine, I appreciate your need for safety, but it's really disconnecting for us. It's, it, I, don't feel, I don't feel comfortable having you with a gun in your purse here. Right? Can we look at some other strategies for meeting your need for safety that don't involve you having a gun? So this is where innovation, this is where creativity, this is where collaboration happens in workplaces. That's why nonviolent communication is so big in the software industry, because it is connected to creative solutions to innovation. We can creatively look at some alternatives for me to meet my need for safety that don't involve carrying a gun. For example, maybe he can escort me to my car if I'm working late in the parking lot, right? So uh, we, we could look at alternatives. So that, that's a simple example of how this works in organizations. But I really want you to get a taste for this in your own life. So let's play a game. This is called Empathy Poker. And it's actually not a game. It's, it's actually a, an experience in deep listening. And I'd like to have some people demonstrate this with me. Now, the way this works is every table will um, get a timer. So could we ask every table that has a deck of cards, please um, pull out a cell phone with a timer. Oh, we've got one. We've got one. And at each table, um, you'll all have a chance to think about something in your life that you're not happy about. It could be something at work. It could be something at home. But what's important is that it's something that's real for you right now that you're spending some energy on, maybe more energy than you'd like. Okay. So think of something in your life right now that you're not happy about, that you're willing to talk to the people at your table for two minutes about. The way this works, and who, who's going to be our star? Who will start with that? Okay. Now, are you okay for the whole room to hear that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> right on. And Dr. I'm fully exposed. Yeah. Do you mind circling your, your thing? And then can we have one more person circle around, um, just to make it as close to a circle as possible. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the way this works is you'll all each take a turn. And see these cards? You will not divide them equally, because that'll take forever. For the remaining people, we've got three people at this table. Roughly divide them quickly into three groups. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. And that is your hand of cards. OK, so the way this works is that the person who is the speaker will start the timer for two minutes and talk about something that they're unhappy about in their life. Listeners, your job is to listen with empathy with your full attention. So this is a practice in mindfulness. The idea is to completely empty yourself of any sort of thoughts that might come up in your mind. If, for example, if he shares something, it's like, oh, I know exactly what you could use, right? Let, let that go, right? It's like, oh, I, that reminds me of something that happened in my life. Let that go. It's like, oh, that happened to a friend of mine. Let that go. So this is this is like mind, this is like meditation in action. Okay, as you listen to what the speaker is saying, your job is to be an empty vessel and to be as present as possible with how he is. Not what stirs up in you, not what thoughts or feelings stir up in you, but be present with the speaker. So if he seems agitated, just be present with the agitation without trying to solve it. If he gets quiet, just be with the silence. How often are we in conversations where there's a silence and we feel like we need to enter that silence, right? So this is a beautiful exercise because no one will be speaking except the speaker. So the silence is guaranteed. But I ask you to try that in your real life, just, just the art of being. So that also means not shuffling through your cards while you're listening to them. Just listen. And at the end of two minutes, you'll get to look at your cards and take a guess at 
that what needs are not being met in this story. Remember how we talked about universal human needs? Appreciation, respect, integrity, safety. Very simply, when we're happy, it means that needs are being met. When we're unhappy, it means that some needs are not being met. It's, it's that simple. So the way that this exercise, empathy poker works, is that you'll have a guess about what needs might not be met underlying his story. And how many of you like to get A's on tests? And you're like, <laughs> okay, me too. I'm one of those kids, I like a little Hermione Granger, you know, yay. So this isn't a test about getting it right. The, the reason that we guess, even though you might not guess correctly, it's about training, this is, these are training wheels, really. It's about training our thinking to be curious, to listen beyond the words about what matters. So it, it's kind of a, an empathy aid, it's empathy training wheels, to help us listen at a deeper level. And um, you'll each have a chance to guess with the cards, and, and we'll demonstrate that in a moment. And at the end, the speaker gets to pick the top two cards that best re reflect his situation, his needs. And then we get to take turns and the next person gets to start. So are you guys ready to, to demonstrate? Okay, yes. uh, timer at two minutes. And Dr. Hami, would you be willing to speak loud enough for others to hear? Yes. Okay, and, and if it helps to stand, you can, even though we won't ask people to stand for the real, or, or just speak loudly. Okay, so, okay um, please begin. Something you're not happy about. Well, I've been um, lately fearful of uh, losing control. And that control is not about my life, but I'm uh, uh, fearful of losing control of my time. I, I believe that I get drawn into uh, behavior that I'm trying to um, step away from. Um, I was a very, very busy, busy doctor. So I was not connected with a lot of you uh, in the room. I was uh, ignoring a lot of conversations uh, because I was in a rush to go to the next task. And uh, I discovered myself. And uh, now I'm in conflict with that because I find myself being fearful of going back to that. And it's a constant fear for me. Um, it's painful. Uh, I experience it every day. And I'm sorry that I'm, I sound emotional because I, it makes me emotional. I, uh, uh, I catch myself every moment that I walk in the hallway and I pass by somebody and I question myself whether I should have stopped and have a conversation at that time. Um, it happens to my family. It happens to friends that I have not connected with for a long time. It happens to all of you that I come across uh, to go and visit a patient in a room and I ask myself whether I should have stopped there for one more moment to have a conversation with you as a nurse, as a respiratory therapist, as a colleague. And uh, that's something that haunts me constantly and I want to break away from that. That's something that I'm willing to let go of today and move forward because I know that that is preventing me from opening up to new possibilities. Um, I'm at a point of my life that I'm looking for new opportunities to grow and I think this is something that has really prevented me from uh, growing. Um, and uh, so I, I, I find myself uh, uh, very, very emotional. I catch myself in conversations with myself, which I hate. Uh, because I think that's my ego talking to me constantly, and so, so that's something that I want to let go of. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So, take a moment and just really sink into the empathy of what you just heard. And what you'll do now is take a look at the cards in your hand, and. Uh, Please pay attention, this, we'll do this in two rounds. And for efficiency, we'll give you a script. If we were to work with you longer, it would be more natural language. But just for first time, this is how it works. You'll, the listeners, you'll go one by one, pick, pick two cards maximum that might reflect the needs or his longings in the situation. 
And the way it works is you'll, you'll go around the circle and just say, are you wanting, boom, and then read the card. And you put it in front of him. So this might take a little time. Do you have your cards? Uh, yes. OK, great. So where do I um, Or do I just show okay. it to him? Right. So, so the first person, let's see. If, well, we'll go ahead and start from Dr. Hami, and we'll go around the circle two times. Each person does one card. And, and you can pass if you don't have any cards you think that fit either. So, so Nancy, you'll start just by asking Dr. Hami. And, and this is, the reason why we call this empathy poker is that he doesn't give the answer until the end. So even though she's going to ask a question, are you wanting more boom, whatever that card is, he's going to wait until all the cards are on the table before he shares what, what mostly, most resonates with him. So you want to go ahead, Nancy? Are you wanting more? Are you wanting more? Courage. Okay. Are you wanting more courage? And she puts that card down. Okay. Now the next person. Are you wanting more engagement and connection? Are you wanting more engagement and connection? Um, are you wanting impact to make a difference? Are you wanting impact to make a difference? Okay. That's one round. You do two rounds so that each person can have at least have two cards that they guess. Okay. Next per Next one. Cooperation. Are you wanting more teamwork or cooperation? Are you wanting more fine play? Now we're ready for the last part of the exercise. We've had the speaking, we've had the guessing, and now we set the timer again for two minutes. Can you do that? <coughs> the timer is important. That way we can have we can all start and stop on time and get some balanced participation. Okay, go ahead. And so now Dr. Hami gets to pick the top two cards that most resonate with his experience and uh, describe how these are important to him in this situation. And you might find that none of the cards resonate. And if that's, if that's true, that's OK. Say what is important to you. So you don't have to force fit it. OK, Dr. Hamu, would you be willing to speak loudly? Yes. Um, how these needs are important to you, the ones you picked? So I chose uh, engagement and connection, obviously, <laughs> because that's what I thought that I was uh, avoiding um, for a long, long time. And I also chose impact to make a difference. Um, another thing that I feel um, connected to, I think it's a sense of loving myself. Um, that's what resonates to me more than anything else. I think that's a lot of us don't love ourselves enough, and so that's why we doubt ourselves constantly. And so that's a conflict that it, I think I have internally that I still don't love myself enough. And uh, I think that's what it is. But I think these two resonate with me more. Thank you. And I love what he just demonstrated, because he demonstrated two important things that I want you to all know for when it's your turn. Number one is, did you notice that Love what was, is what was up for him more than anything. And that wasn't in the deck. So that's an example of if there's something that's still in your heart that you're wanting, even if it's not on the table, to name it. So thank you for having that clarity. And then second, the two minutes is just a maximum. If you finish before two minutes, great, because then more people can share in your group. So you don't have to stretch it. For those of you who were speakers, who got to share your story, who would be willing to um, speak briefly? How was it like for you to be listened to with empathy at the level of needs? How was this experience for you to be listened to at this level? Who, let's hear from maybe one or two people. Dr. Hami, could you stand up and? Sure. Obviously, the, the, the most difficult thing for all of us and myself is to just sit and listen. Because that's the that's one. Because we always have an opinion, right? We, we know what's right, and we know what's wrong. We hear it, we know exactly what to say. But to just sit there for a moment and listen is the most important step that we can have in a one-to-one -one communication with somebody else. And I wish all the governments and presidential elector, uh, election <laughs> candidates would do the same thing. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway lesson for me 
to be able to just sit, uh, listen, and to create that heart-to-heart -heart connection at that one moment. Well, if I could ask you, since you're up, um, what was it like for you to receive empathy this way? It was very, very rewarding. It's, it's very rewarding, it's heartwarming, it takes the weight off your shoulders because you're not bearing the weight of that uh, conversation. You know, we have conversations with ourselves constantly, and that's very, very um, heavy. And, and I think that when you have somebody that listens to you without judging you and try to connect with you at a heart-to-heart -heart level, it's very rewarding. I noticed within the first, literally first couple minutes of starting this exercise, already there was emotions being shown from some of the speakers. So that tells me that maybe you don't get that this kind of opportunity that often to really share what's going on for you at this level and to be listened to at this level. Can we hear from one more person? What was it like for you to receive empathy? I mean, in, in your profession, you're caregivers. What was it like for you to receive? Let's hear from one more. Yeah. Could, can you stand up so we can hear? Yes. Um, it was very emotional, like you said, you know, share your feelings. And, um, and like Dr. Hani said, um, we have internal conversations where we try, we try to downplay things or we try to compensate for things or, you know, try to make things seem like it's okay, you'll get over it, you know, those kinds of things. But when you finally let it out and you share it, um, it's like the walls break and, and the water just comes pouring down like a big flood. And so um, it was scary and um, it feels a little awkward, you know, for that moment as well to, to see how other people are gonna react towards you thinking, are you just, you know, making a big thing out of nothing, you know? Um, but then you get this warm feeling when um, everybody does a, a light touch or just says a couple words to, um, to acknowledge that it's okay for you to feel that way. Yeah, to be received without judgment, as Dr. Hami said. Exactly. As you are. That is empathy. To be received as you are. How beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. But I asked for your colleagues at the table, how is it like for you to listen at this level? To listen beyond the words? To listen with empathy? Could, would some of them be willing to speak on what it was like for you as a listener? Well, I, I felt, I felt her. Uh, I, she almost made me cry. I was holding my hand. What, what moved you? What, what was powerful for you about this experience as a listener? to give her some appreciation for, for whatever her situation was. I think it was so neat was that I got I felt connected to her ah. on a different level. Like I see her, I've known her, I've seen her in the hallways, but now I feel like I'm an emotional connection to her. Just from listening and <clears throat> How many of you shared that same experience as a listener, that you felt connected to the person you were listening to at a different level, a different level of connection? I'm so glad to hear that, and thank you for saying it so purely, because that's what I was hoping you would all get from this exercise, is that in our day-to-day -day urgencies and work, you know, we wear many hats, you know, you're the patient, I'm the nurse, you're the doctor, and it's very easy just to talk to people at that level. What, I was, what I'm really happy about is that you were able to experience connecting with each other at the level of humanity that transcends our jobs, our roles. This is just a person expressing pain. Can I hear beyond the words to what's important underlying that pain? And I'm so, I'm so delighted how quickly you were able to jump into that. So just to summarize um, what I'd like you to take away and to continue using, 
is to remember the power of needs. You know, you may not be able to walk around with these cards. Actually, at, at Merck Pharmaceutical, we had little pocket <laughs> lists of needs that they would pull out sometimes for their telephone meetings. And when they'd have meetings, they'd actually refer to the list saying, oh, um, is this about efficiency? You know, <laughs> are you wanting more of this? And I'm hoping that you'll remember, before jumping straight to advice, to take a moment and even if it's silently, to first connect at the level of needs. In the same way that you were guessing, is this about inclusion? Is this about respect? Is this about love? If you can hold that possibility, what is this about for the person that you're speaking to, for the person that you're caring for, the person that you're working with? What's beyond the words that really matters to them? If you can first connect even silently to that, my guess and my hope is that you'll find that the actual action part, the advice giving, the solutions, the strategies, will go that much smoother. And in some cases, maybe might not even be needed. How many of you ever just wanted to be listened to and you didn't need advice? How many of you actually love unsolicited advice? <laughs> okay, so you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> So I want to give you some resources. Um, what you experience today in this one hour is a small slice of a day-long program that I do at USC called Listening for Breakthroughs. And that day-long program is a small slice of a six-month program that my company does that can totally transform the culture of an organization to a more empathic culture. So I just want to let you know, this is a small slice of a very large subject. This is one little tool of an entire Stanley toolbox of, of practices and principles for empathy. And, I, and I, hope, I hope you catch the fever the way I did. So if you want to learn more, there's some resources I want to give you. Um, one is, um, on some of the desks, you have the option of joining my company's mailing list. A few times a year, about three or four times a year, we send out some free little micro-skill videos, little free mini trainings on how to be a collaborative, empathic uh, professional, focusing on uh, empathic leadership skills. Uh, we won't, we'll keep your privacy and we won't share your name. You'll, we actually could do a better job of getting out to you more frequently. Um, there's a book called Nonviolent Communication, A Language for Life. And I regret, I think there's even a book on NVC, nonviolent communication, in the healthcare field. And I'm, if someone wants to look it up, I can probably find it or send it up as a follow-up to anyone. I think it's called something like humanizing healthcare. If you, if you do keywords, nonviolent communication and humanizing healthcare, I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a book on that. And I, I, I regret that I didn't think of this until 5.30 a.m. this morning. So, and then finally, Online, there's a resource called nbcacademy.org. Um, you know, I, I don't make any money by promoting this, but I, I do know the person who founded it. And it's a, there's a lot of free and low-cost resources uh, on how to learn more about NBC um, and, and how that might serve you in your life. So um, if you get on my mailing list, there's a big conference coming up in March. On, for the NBC conference, um, and it's like 500 people, and I think it, it's, it's semi-subsidized by uh, different organizations, and so for $65, you get two days of training from myself and some amazing trainers that are certified in nonviolent communication. It's, it's the best deal in town. People pay hundreds of dollars for even one of these workshops and you get two full days of a smorgasbord of workshops. So, so it's a good deal, so um, I can let you know about that. Um, any questions before we break? All right, well, it's been a pleasure serving you. Um, thank you.